Good afternoon. Thank you, it's a big pleasure to be here, uh, and I'm very grateful to the organizers for the opportunity. Um, I'm no designer, I'm a scientist, and, but I feel marveled at the marvels of the, of, the, of the universe, and the design of the universe. And my job and my passion is actually to try and understand the universe. And in particular, I'm most fascinated by thinking what planets are there and what planets may resemble our own. So going into the focus of this meeting, do we need another planet? Question. But I'm trying to answer the question that's now on the stage. Is there another planet? Is there a planet that resembles our own? Is there a possible second home out there? I was talking about the Earth, our planet. Um, this planet that looks eternal, it's always been there and will be there forever. And until not so many years ago, we thought it was also an endless source of resources that we could depend on, rely on. Now we've seen that this is not the case. Uh, we've seen that the resources in our planet are just not sufficient. Our ecological footprint is getting bigger and bigger, and maybe our resources are getting less and less. And we may think that, well, this is not going to last, not gonna last forever. So can we go anywhere else and mess somewhere else up? Well. Speaking of eternity, not even our planet is eternal, and not even the conditions on the surface will last forever. Maybe you have heard about asteroid collisions and impacts on our own Earth. And it seems down here that we're really protected, that we have to deal with our own environment, and that's it. And it's actually just an illusion. We, will, we have an, an, a surrounding that is, can be also potentially dangerous to, uh, to us. And a very good example is uh, asteroids coming from the from outside meteorites. You know probably very well about the extinction of the dinosaurs. This happened about 65 million years ago. Will this happen again? Sure, it will. There will be other rocks falling onto us from uh, the universe. Actually, the plot there shows that we have a impact from some sort of rock from space every seven million years on average that has catastrophic dimensions. Of course, this, we are here only for two million years as humans, so seven million years seems like a long time. But if you want to prevail here on the surface, we'll have to look and be prepared for this, or at least be aware that this will happen. And once every roughly 100 million years, there's an event as strong as the one that killed the dinosaurs. The dinosaurs. We'll, be subject, we'll, be, we'll be subject to the same kind of uh, event, probably, if we live long enough and our planet is inhabited long enough. We humans like to colonize, and we've thought about going to other places in the universe and starting with our solar system. We've thought about going to the uh, moon, of course. We, we were on the moon, humans. We will be back again probably in the next few years. There's talk about establishing a permanent lunar base in the next maybe 20 years or so. We're thinking about planet Mars, of course, and we're thinking about also sending humans out there to colonize, quotes, Mars. Um, but this will just buy us time. This is just something that we will do for science to push some sort of social action as well on this. But if we think about establishing humanity on these planets or moons, this will not be a viable option. Uh, you've probably heard about terraforming planets, terraforming Mars. Well, that's just science fiction. It will be really extremely hard to make Mars a living environment. So, you think about eternity and how long will our planet last? Well, our planet has been here for about five billion years when the sun was born. And we, life on this planet, have been around for about three and a half billion years. Our life, our sun, sorry, is a star that has a lifetime. It started five billion years ago and will end in five billion years, more or less. So we are now at the middle of the sun's lifetime. And you may think, well, we still have five billion years to go. Well, no. Our planet will cease to be habitable much sooner than that. Of course, I'm talking about astronomical dates, let's say, or numbers. These are huge. But still, it's not so long ago in the future. In about 200 to 500 million years, our planet will be so hot because of the sun's evolution, nothing to do with us, just to do with our environment, that the oceans will start to evaporate. So we'll have a drier and drier Earth. There's going to be more and more light coming from the sun, 
all the uh, oceans will be vaporized into the atmosphere, and then there's going to be something called runaway greenhouse effect, which will actually dry out our entire planet. Well, 200, 500 million years sounds like a, a long way in the future, it's true. But think that life on our planet has been here for three and a half billion years, so we have a lot less than we have spent on our planet, actually, in the future. And then, further along in the future, in five billion years or so, our own sun will engulf Earth. So this will be the end of it, right? And then our sun will become a white dwarf and planetary nebula and so on. So this is, in short, the history that remains for us here. So do we want humanity to be eternal? Maybe not. Maybe we're not doing so great to actually merit being here forever. But we may think about our environment and what's out there. Of course, the motivation to understand our surroundings is not for humans to colonize, but it's, also, it's mostly or mainly or just for now uniquely a uh, scientific motivation. So the first place to look and explore is our own solar system. I spoke about Mars, I spoke about the Moon. You probably have heard about possibility of life on the frozen moons or the icy moons of Saturn and Jupiter, Europa, Enceladus, Ganymede. Those will be interesting places to study, but these are not environments where humans can actually be. Not even astronauts, not even a, a large human colony. So let's go out to the stars and try and see what other Earths may be out there. This is a simulation of Sol sky tonight at midnight. And uh, of course, if you go out there, you try and look at the sky, you won't see this. We have a big problem called light pollution. This was mentioned a few times already. Uh, the night sky in Seoul, probably you'll see 50 to 100 stars. And if you go to a dark place, you may see a few thousand stars. And this is a big drama of today's. So we're really disconnected from, from the sky. So here in the Northern Hemisphere, you look at the nearby stars, and we can look at this little star here, rather uh, unremarkable. This is the closest sun-like star to our solar system visible from the Northern Hemisphere. It's called Tau Ceti. By the way, if there's any astro amateur astronomer, you've probably recognized Orion there, Taurus, there's a nice uh, wintertime constellations that are seen. Let's just go and zoom in. Let's imagine that around this sun, there is a solar system like our own. This star sits at 12 uh, light years, which is just in our backyard. It's really close to us. And as I say, it's a sun-like star. So I've plotted here already our solar system at scale in this plot. Imagine that we want to observe this solar system and take a picture of this star and see a little rosary of planets uh, orbiting this star. Would that, wouldn't that be simple? Would it be simple to go and hunt for planets taking images of those planets? Well, let's see what happens. Let's try and zoom in until we see this planetary system. So we get a bit closer, even a bit closer. Those that are sitting in the front may start to see something there at the middle and getting even a lot closer. And our full solar system is just embedded in the glare of this star. It's even worse because these are our eight planets in the solar system. The light coming from our Earth, if, put, if placed at that place, would be one billion times fainter than the light coming from the star. So this picture that we would take is impossible. It's impossible because the light that comes from the planet is completely swamped by the light coming from the star. So no way here. What we have done, astronomers have done, is try and look for planets using indirect techniques. So we don't take pictures of planets, we see how planets affect their stars. And I'm going to talk about two of the methods. There's like a, a, a plethora of methods, indirect techniques, that uh, allow us to find planets. And the two most popular ones, popular meaning the most successful ones, are the two I'm marking here. So I'm going to explain those. The other ones are fancier, let's say. But at the base of all these techniques is that we're not seeing planets directly. We're seeing the effects of planets on the stars by changing position, velocity, or brightness. This is at the core of the detection. So we're blind, but we find ways, actually, ways around. The most successful technique in the past was something called radio velocities. Uh, this is something called the Doppler effect, by which an, an object that emits light, when it goes towards the observer or away from the observer, that light gets shifted in wavelength. 
astronomers are very good at measuring those shifts. And we do this with spectra. You see these kind of things, right? So we see the spectrum of the light, which means the light decomposed in its colors, shifting back and forth. If we see a star that is shifting back and forth in a specific way, we can deduce that that star is orbited by an invisible planet. And this is how we find planets and how the first planet was found exactly 25 years ago. This planet that was found was a new kind of planet that was not existing in our solar system. This was called a hot Jupiter. So it's a Jupiter-sized planet, like our own in a solar system, but placed so close to its star that the temperature on this planet is about 1,000 degrees. So it's a place really not hospitable to life. So if we're planning on moving or spending vacation or something on this planet, it's a no-no, right? Uh, it's uh, much worse than a sauna. The people who actually found this... Yeah. Okay, sorry. So the people who were able to find these planets, this first planet, by the way, its name was 51 Pegasi, B, so the star, is, the star name is 51 Pegasi, and the planets we named with the letter, small letter, after the, the planet, after the star name. So 51 Pegasi B is the first planet found around 51 Pegasi. The people who were responsible for this discovery are here in the picture. These are my dear friends and colleagues, uh, Didier Kelos to the left and Michel Mayor to the right. These are Swiss astronomers, and they just received the Nobel Prize for Physics of this year, two days ago. So they will be going and collecting this Nobel Prize for this very discovery, for the discovery of this um, planet around this sun-like star. This was the start of this new era into trying and understanding uh, planetary systems around our own. The other technique that we use is called transits. Transits are very simple. It's not about things moving around. It's about things occulting each other. We're talking about a planet. If you have the luck that the plane of the orbit of your star, of, the, of your planet, sorry, is exactly edge on, each time in every orbit, there's going to be an eclipse. The planet will occult the star. And you can see this in the plot. When the planet passes in front of the star, the star gets dimmer because something darker is occulting the face of the star. So we've become extremely good at detecting these kind of variations. There's satellites out there, there's space missions which observe thousands of stars in search for these kinds of dips. And this has been enough to find today over 4,000 planets in our galaxy. It's just the tip of the iceberg. There's many, many more to come. So here's a simulation. By the way, we use artists to tell us, or we tell artists how these planets might look like. Of course, we've never been there, and we probably will never be. And uh, together with scientists, we uh, put together these simulations that explain a great deal about what we think these planets may be like. And this is called a hot super-Earth. So a planet that is larger than our own, and it's much hotter than ours, with a temperature uh, in the neighborhood of 2,000 degrees, orbiting a star that's called Kepler-10, found by this spacecraft called Kepler. And we can just imagine how this planet might be. It's so hot that we think that the surface may be melted. And so we're now flying over this hypothetical surface and seeing these canyons and valleys with magma in them. The other interesting thing of this planet is that it has one phase that is always daytime and another phase that is always nighttime. So it's uh, because it's synchronized, it's captured. It's like the moon to our Earth. There's one phase that's always facing us. Here, there's one phase that's always facing its star. This is Kepler-10. This was the first super-Earth discovered by this mission called Kepler. So 25 years later, we have faced now with a complete collection of planets of all sorts. Of course, these are, I'm saying that these are just simulations. We don't know what they're like. We're just inventing what they may be. But we've found planets of all sizes and of all temperatures and covering a large, what we call, parameter space. So they cover everything. 
in a way. This is just a snapshot of a few hundreds of them. But you have to imagine that we have over 4,000 of these planets found so far. One of the most incredible things that we have found is that planets are extremely common. So if you go out and you look at the sky tonight, I think it's cloudy, but maybe tomorrow night, and you go to a place where you see some stars, you have to think that every other star at least have a planet orbiting it. So planets are extremely abundant. There's Earth-sized planets all over the place. There's Neptune-sized planets all over the place. And there's less large planets like Jupiter and so on. But this, to me, is one of the greatest results that we've had in the last five years or so, that planetary systems are extremely common. If you think about a star that is forming, the most likely thing for this star to do is to form as well a planetary system. So we are not by any means unique. We are surrounded by many planets in our own galaxy. Well, you know, science fiction, right? We have seen lots of movies about uh, people cruising around the galaxy, finding uh, different sites in the universe and so on. And it's been the most surprising thing, thing that, to see that nature usually surpasses the imagination of movie writers and movie directors. Maybe you know some of these sh shots here, right? So if you're some, some Star Wars fan here, which I am actually, from the first Star Move, uh, Wars movies, not the latest ones, um, you see that Luke Skywalker was living at the beginning in Tatooine, this planet. And Tatooine had a feature that it had two suns, right? So, oops, sorry. So George Lucas, oops, imagined a place that would be light with two suns. And you could imagine, well, this is just George Lucas's imagination. This place doesn't exist in the universe. Well, wrong. We have found about 10 Tatooines out of these 4,000 planets that we have found. So there's planets that have two suns on the sky. And there's many other kinds of planets, extremely hot planets where one phase is completely melted and the other phase is very cool. Planets that are usually, that we think are the ice worlds, planets that could well be water worlds. So all these different worlds that the imagination can actually get to, they seem to be real also in the universe. So this is our galaxy. This is our Milky Way galaxy as seen from above. Of course, this, this is not a picture. We could not, never take this picture. This is a, a, a drawing, a simulation. We have here our galaxy, our uh, central bar of the galaxy, and all the spiral arms. And we live here. This is the bulge. It's a very nasty place to live in. Lots of supernovae and things happening here. And we live here in the, in the outskirts, about 20,000 light years from the center while the galaxy is about 100,000 light, light years across. All these 4,000 planets that we have found are here in this tiny little region, in this 5,000 light year area. We think that out of beyond these 4,000, there's going to be many, many more. If you think that every other star has a planet and our galaxy has 300 billion stars, you do the math yourself. We're talking about billions of planets in our own galaxy. And our own galaxy is only one out of billions of galaxies out there. So we would be really presumptuous to think that we are unique in any sense. We'll see, but numbers are huge, let's say. So we're interested in finding planets all across the galaxy, but we're especially interested in finding those that are closest to us that are real neighbors, are planets that, not now, maybe in hundreds of years or maybe in, in thousands of years, humanity may think about going and studying them, not necessarily colonizing them. This is a, it's an, it's a nasty word. So there are 40 stellar systems within 15 light years. So think about astronomical distances, 15 light years is light going at 300,000 kilometers per second, it takes 15 years to travel. So in this volume, there are about 40 stars. Half of them have planets. Actually, half of this half, we have found the planets ourselves in, in the group that I'm working in. 
So there's a list here of these stars. They all have fancy names. Um, uh, Alpha Centauri, Barna Star, Wolf 359, and so on. These are really not so nice. And this is the, light, the distances in light years from this 4.2, 4 which is the closest to us, called Proxima Centauri, out to almost 15. So these are our immediate neighbors. If we went out to the galaxy and started traveling around, these would be the, the, the places we would get first. These are the real nearby stars. And some of them, as I'll show you in a second, may be planets that are interesting to us, that may be potentially habitable. And you'll see what this means in a second. So what are the first stops in this interstellar travel? The first obvious stop is the Alpha Centauri system. Alpha Centauri has three stars. They're not visible from the northern hemisphere. One is a sun-like star, very similar to our own sun. There's another one that is uh, slightly cooler. And there's a tiny red dwarf, we call it, which is a star that is about 10 times smaller than our sun. This is the closest star to us, Proxima Centauri. It sits at about four light years distance, meaning that if we send, ever send some sort of message to that star, the travel time of that message would be four years, and then if there's any response, hypothetically, this response would take another four years to come to us. So any communication you can think of with Proxima Centauri would take at least eight years to say hello and how are you, right? So this, this would take eight years. The second closest is called Barnard Star. Barnard Star is sitting at about six light years distance, and it's also a red dwarf, slightly larger than Proxima, but also very, very small. So we have found worlds, planets, around these two stars. Again, imagination, artists, uh, we talk to uh, scientists, so we talk to, uh, to these artists, say, well, I imagine a rocky world, like ours, but probably drier than ours, and lit by a star that is much redder than our sun. So this could be a hypothetical view of Proxima Centauri b. For my taste, it's a bit too dry. There may be some water on Proxima Centauri b, we'll see. But anyways, this is what you would see, hypothetically, if you went to this planet, which is, again, the closest exoplanet to our own Earth. A bit further out, you may be interested in Barnard B, this planet that uh, we found about a year ago, and we announced about a year ago, and we just met. And this is what we call a super-Earth, so a planet that is larger than our Earth. We think it's rocky, so like, a, like our own Earth. But this is a frozen planet. So this planet, we believe, has a temperature on the surface surrounding 150 degrees below zero, freezing. So we imagine this as an icy world, maybe, also lit with a light from a very red star, it's Barnard B uh, star. So Barnard B is for sure, almost for sure, not habitable. Proxima Centauri B, maybe, but what do we call, uh, how do we define a planet that is habitable? Well, we now, scientists, know very little about life. We know so little and that we cannot impose any conditions. And the only condition we impose is that a planet that we call habitable has liquid water on the surface. The only thing we cannot separate us from, life, is from liquid water. Of course, you may ask, well, could you think about other forms of life? Or other, actually, it's not forms of life, of other chemistry of life. And maybe the answer is yes. Maybe we can think about chemistry of life or of other types but we wouldn't recognize it. We would, we'd have it here at the front, and we wouldn't be able to tell that that's an alive being. So we start by looking for places where we find water, liquid water. In our solar system, you see here a portrait, not to scale. There is an area, so the temperature, of course, increases towards the sun. There is an area in which the water is in form of ice. There is another area in which water comes in form of vapor. And, oh, surprise, we live where we are at the right spot, right? It is also called sometimes the Goldilocks zone. So the right spot where we live, where the temperature is exactly what we need. And we need it because water can be liquid. 
if you have a keen eye, you may see that Mars is actually in this green zone as well. So we think that Mars had liquid water in the past, may have it also in the future, depending on some things. But it's technically a habitable planet, but it's much smaller than our Earth. And so it, didn't, it was not able to maintain its, its uh, surface water. It's not quite as easy as thinking, OK, temperature has to be between 0 and 100 degrees, so we go and calculate where this is. Well, you know, a climate of a planet is a complex thing. It's a balance between the incoming energy from its star, from the sun, with the outgoing energy, because it's hot. Right? And you do this balance, and for the Earth, the big surprise is that the equilibrium temperature of the Earth is 18 degrees below zero, minus 18. So what happens? Well, our mean global temperature is 15 degrees Celsius. So there's an extra 33 degrees that comes from the so-called greenhouse gases. And for our Earth, this is water vapor and CO2. So greenhouse gases can, have been demonized. It's bad. They're awful. Well, this is, they are the sole region, reason why we can inhabit Earth. CO2 is what stabilizes our climate. Let's put it this way. It's the thermostat of our climate. And we, we puny humans, what we're doing is playing around with our thermostat. And that's really dangerous. But CO2 itself is key to stabilize our planet. So we, like, we have to like greenhouse gases, but we have to be, I mean, not mess with them, let's say. So natural sources of greenhouse gases. The same way our planet works, we think, could apply to all planets in the universe. So their climate systems may be stabilized by these greenhouse gases and the renewal of these kinds of greenhouse gases. For technical, for if anyone is interested in the technical details, this is called the carbonate silicate uh, mechanism. Right? So do we know of any habitable planets so far? Well, almost. Uh, there is a famous star called TRAPPIST-1, which was discovered by uh, a group of uh, Belgian astronomers, which has seven planets that are almost like our own Earth. Three of these planets sit in this habitable zone, so they could have liquid water on the surface. This is amazing. This star is sitting about 40 light years away, so it's not really close, but it's not that far. These planets are also orbiting a tiny little star, a star that is much smaller than our sun and also much cooler. So for these planets to be warm enough, they have to be really, really close to its star. And there's seven of them. And there's probably many more. And can you imagine how these planets might be? It's actually kind of counterintuitive. This could be a picture of one of these planets. It's what we call an eyeball planet. And we have a mental reference of how a planet looks like from our Earth, right? So we have an equatorial region, which is hot, and then liquid water, of course, and we have polar caps that are cool and icy. And depending on how cool the planet is, those polar caps get, go lower or higher and so on. These planets that live around these tiny little stars are synchronized. They always face the, 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 the star, well, one face always faces the star, and the other face is always nighttime. So for these planets, there would be one site that would be habitable, liquid water, and the other side would be always nighttime, freezing cold and icy, let's say. So you could imagine yourself going to this planet on vacation, and if you like, uh, I don't know, going to the beach and going to the swim and sun, you would be going to the uh, daylight or the day site, let's say, where it would be 24-hour sun, always at the same position. And if you're more interested in skiing, you'd go to the night site. We'll be always night site skiing, though. Um, but this is done today already on Earth, so that shouldn't be a big deal. So this is this reference, mental reference, how planets should look like may likely not apply to these planets that we're finding. So, Here's a bit of a technical plot, but I'll walk you through this. Here is a plot of planet mass in Earth masses versus separation of the, of the, of the, of the planet. Right? The units are astronomical units, so 
The Earth sits here at one astronomical unit, one Earth mass. Each little dot is a discovered planet. So each dot of different colors, this is a planet that we found. There's four, uh, 4,100 of these here. In red, there are those found with transits, and in blue are those found using radio velocities. I was explaining at the beginning. So aren't you really worried of this plot? All these little symbols here are our planets in our own solar system. And don't you see that there's not even one dot of these color dots close to our own planet? So we haven't... So all the planets we found sit in a region that is, does not exist in our solar system. So we haven't found yet any single Earth-like planet or any single Earth twin out of these 4,000 that we have. Meaning a planet that's orbiting a star like our own, and it's orbiting with roughly a year time and having the right temperature. We haven't found Earths, we haven't found Venuses or Mercuries or Marses. We have found maybe a few Jupiters out there because they're easy to find. Well, you could think, well, the solar system then is unique. There is no other system like ours in the entire galaxy. And this is wrong. It's wrong because this plot is strongly biased. We are very good at finding planets that are hot or close to the star and very massive, but we are not so good at finding uh, planets that are away from their star and really low mass. So this region at the uh, lower right corner is still to be filled in. I'm sure there's going to be thousands or millions or maybe billions of planets down there, but we don't have the technology yet to find them. This will happen maybe in five, ten years, maybe 20 years, that we will take this road and be able to populate this and find planets like our own. So a true Earth twin we haven't found out of 4,000 planets that we have encountered so far. Out of these 4,000, how many are habitable? Well, let's, let's be... Let's use language properly. How many are potentially habitable? And I'll explain the difference in a second. 21. Out of these 4,000 or 4,100, 21 would have the right conditions for surface liquid water. Maybe some are familiar. Proxima Centauri B, top left. Uh, Tau Ceti, I spoke about Tau Ceti. Um, Trappist, the Trappist planets down here. So these are the planets that we have found so far that might be best to host life. And here in parentheses, their distance. Four light years, 12, 17, and some are really far, so it's, they're really difficult for us to, to even think about. So this illustrates not that finding these planets is difficult, uh, sorry, that they're uncommon, but that finding them is quite difficult. So, 21 planets are potentially habitable. That means that are within this habitable zone region, and they're rocky. How many of these are actually habitable, meaning that they do have oceans, do have liquid water on the surface? Question mark. We haven't seen water on any other planet on the surface. How many of these are actually inhabited? so have life on the surface and have an active biosphere? Double question mark, even a bigger mystery. These two questions we may answer in the future. We, have, we are de devising, we are developing instruments and missions that in the next few decades may be able to take us uh, here. How many are human-friendly, where we can breathe? Well, triple question mark. I think this we, don't, we shouldn't imagine what we see in science fiction movies, that there's going to be a planet there and uh, humans can happily walk down their spacecrafts and, uh, and uh, w walk, around, walk around that planet. This is very unlikely that it happens. Uh, there may be many combinations of atmospheres that will be completely toxic to us, although life on those planets may be just happy and thriving. So this road to some place where humans can be seems very uh, long and, and not so straight. So, let's imagine that we have technology or that we decide to go on a trip to the nearest star or the nearest planet, Proxima, right? Proxima B, I said, may be habitable, maybe it has oceans. So let's take a spacecraft 
and let's go there. Let's imagine that we have the technology that we have today, maybe 30 years ago. The fastest spacecraft that we have built, and it's leaving the solar system, it's still from the 70s. That's Voyager 1, actually, which was launched to explore the outer solar system. Voyager 1 is leaving rapidly our solar system at, uh, I think it's 16,000 kilometers per hour. Imagine that we point this spacecraft to Proxima Centauri b, and you calculate how long it would take to get to Proxima Centauri b. Well, get ready for 75,000 years of trip. So this would be a 75,000-year trip. So for humans, that's just inconceivable, right? Right now. Means that interstellar travel, either we find a different, completely different way of, let's say, of, of transporting ourselves, or we have to really change our conception of how we travel those distances. Maybe we are too biased into thinking that we humans have to make the trip, or human beings. Maybe, maybe it's human civilization that should travel from one star to the other. But if we think that time is endless and we have enough time to go around the, uh, the galaxy, and then you can do a bit more calculations. And uh, if you want to colonize the galaxy at this speed, it's not so bad. Um, in about 100 million years, you're this way. In 500 million years, you're already at the center of the galaxy. And in uh, a billion years, you have crossed the entire galaxy. So one billion years, it's a long time, but this is nothing compared to the lifetime of our planet. So it may not be unthinkable. Last night, we were discussing about the Fermi paradox, meaning that, well, if civilizations are so common on our galaxy, how come we don't see their spacecraft floating around all the time? I have no answer, and no one does. So for now, we have to uh, just keep looking. But anyway, colonizing, colonizing or exploring the galaxy may not be crazy if you have enough time, right? even at the very slow pace that we are having our spacecraft in the uh, universe. So I think I've, I've proved to you that our own planet, our Earth, is still unique. And by all means, this is the best place for us to live in. We haven't found any single spot in the universe that is better than our own Earth. Maybe because we're adapted to it, but even, not even close, let's say, in terms of how good it is. We have a planet that has a strong protecting magnetic field that has plate tectonics. All this is extremely important for our climate to be stable. We have a large moon that stabilizes the rotation axis, avoiding chaotic climate change and so on. We have a, a distant giant planet, our old Jupiter, that is protecting us from outside impacts. So if we didn't have Jupiter, those impacts I spoke at the beginning, which happen once every seven million years, would happen much more often. And we have our sun, a dependable star that provides a stable environment. No other planetary system in the universe that we have found so far gets even close to kind of these conditions, let's say. Are we really destroying our planet with global warming? Uh, you know, there's a lot of discussion about temperature rises. There's no, to me, no obvious objective argument against the temperature rise. But there's some climate denialists that think, well, this is not us, it's some external factors, like our sun. So our sun is changing our climate. And yeah, if that is done in the past, and you, when you plot here temperature, spots on the sun and so on, you may think, well, there's a bit of correlation, right? So this goes up, this goes up again. So maybe the temperature of our planet is linked to changes on the star. Well, no. Um, CO2 keeps rising, temperature keeps going up, and the sun is going down. So we are doing it. It's us humans who are responsible for climate change. It's not our star. Our star is there happily evolving, but nothing to do with us. Maybe in, in 100 million years, it will be our star doing it, but not now. So I think this, this point was made as well. We're, we're not making our planet inhabitable. We're changing its temperature, and we're making it resemble a planet like it was in the time of the dinosaurs. So this is the temperature of our planet along its history. We're down here. So it's actually pretty much a lot lower than it was at the time of the dinosaurs, which is six to eight degrees higher. 
So we humans are altering our environment for our own problems, let's say. It's not the planet. The planet will actually survive that. We are messing things up, but it's okay. So it's us that we have to look after ourselves in a way. Anyway, so my main point is that for now, we, we really have to look after what we have. Um, I don't know if you know about this picture. This is a very famous picture. It's the so-called pale blue dot. This blue dot here is one pixel on this image, and this is our planet, our Earth, as seen from six billion kilometers. This is a picture taken by Voyager 1 when it was living uh, on its way to uh, leaving the solar system, and this is our planet. And there's a very nice quote by uh, Carl Sagan, which you can read. There's a very nice article about this. It's not so long, and it, it makes you think that everything we're, we're, uh, we have done, all the history of humanity, everything that's happened, it's happened in this tiny little speck of light that we see here at six billion distance. So uh, all conquerors, all people with ambitions, everything fits in this one pixel. So maybe sometime in the future, uh, we will see our planet from this distance, from, uh, from um, a spacecraft leaving our solar system. This is still going to take a long time, I think. I don't think there's any reason to think that leaving our planet will be anything viable, probably in centuries, maybe in millennia. So, for now, we will have to be happy living here and making sure that we, present, we preserve habitable conditions on our own Earth. And that it's not only about caring about our planet, it's also about caring about the people, caring about what we have in the environment. We have so far been working out of selfishness. So selfishness we may have to abandon and to change our state of mind. So I think we've gotten this far through uh, individualism and competition. And it may be about time to change paradigm and to go into a more collaborative design, let's say, that we have more of a human conscience, more of a community conscience. I like to believe that we astronomers or people who look for life elsewhere can contribute to that. Maybe if we find life in other planets, we will be more conscious, more aware of what we have here, and more aware of our human uh, fellow citizens. So it's, not, it's preserving humans, and it's preserving everything else, culture, traditions, values, languages, and so on. And I'd like to finish by a self-reference here. Uh, I come from a really small area in the northeastern part of the Iberian Peninsula in Europe. And this is a nation without a state that has been there for a thousand years or more. And now it's uh, trying to exist, to survive and to thrive, like any of the other countries that we have in a global world. So I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ramsamida.